attention on the very, very, very important and amazing doctrine of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Again, if you're not super familiar with this, that word, it's one of those big, loud, kind of crazy sounding words that really means something pretty simple. Incarnation means in flesh. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas. That's what we are celebrating today as we look at Jesus' birthday and we think about that baby in the manger and his entrance into this world. As Steve mentioned earlier, this amazing miracle that took place that Jesus, 100% eternal creator God, stepped into this world and combined with his godness, 100% man. And the unique and never going to be repeated before person of Jesus Christ. God incarnate right here for us. Again, John chapter 1 and verse 14 has been our theme verse for this series. And we have been learning about this, how the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. Again, that miracle, 100% God, 100% man, through the miracle of the incarnation, is who Jesus Christ was and still is today. A profound truth, which I've got to say is just amazing the more you think about it and what God did for us. And a truth that is still benefiting us very much today. You know, there's so much that we could say about this, but we, of course, have only so much time in a month and so much time in a day. And uh, so we're going to kind of just, again, remind you where we have been and what we have highlighted as we've been working through this study this morning. And we're going to cap that off with our time here in Philippians. But just, again, reminder of the three things that we have highlighted, the benefits of Jesus being God incarnate for us. Because Jesus came in the flesh, we learned week number one. He revealed to us who God is, up close, personal, giving us the opportunity to be able to taste for ourselves God's unending grace and truth. Second week, we learned how Jesus, because he came in the flesh, he understands us. Isn't that awesome? He understands us down to the very, very being of who we are, and that gives us confidence to come to seek his help before the throne of grace and know that he is going to be there as we face the various challenges of life. And then last week we learned, because Jesus came in the flesh, he is able to save all who believe in him. Making eternal life, that life of God with all of its limitless, amazing, numerous benefits and perks, something that we can possess for ourselves. And that is just the tip of the iceberg, my friends, of what Jesus has made possible by coming into this world for us. And for all that and more, as we're to learn today, God the Father now says Jesus deserves the greatest recognition possible. And that's why today we're going to close out our study on why the incarnation still matters with this message that we're entitling this, He Deserves. Jesus Deserves. Philippians chapter, five, I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. That's where we're going here, all right? Follow along for a minute in your Bible. I think it's probably a fairly familiar passage to many of you, but an amazing, amazing one. Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 5. I'm going to read down through verse 11 this morning. And this is what the Word of God again has to say to us about our Savior come in the flesh. It says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But instead, he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And notice what verse 9 says, and this is where we'll be kind of directing our attention mostly today. It says, Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That, my friends, is one of the most amazing sections of scripture that you will ever come across. It is so deep, it is so loaded as it tells us more about Jesus in a little paragraph than we find in a lot of other places in all the Bible. But for today, instead of having to really dig in and explore, which honestly we could probably spend weeks kind of doing, I just want you to notice three very simple points. First one is this. Verse 6 tells us Jesus is fully God. 
That's what it means when it talks about the fact that he was found in the form or had the very nature of God. At the core of who Jesus is. He has been. He is right now. He will always be the one true eternal God. Everything that you can think of that's true about God, all those essential characteristics that make him who he is and mark him off as being God, Jesus possessed every single one of those in completion. In fact, that verse, if you look down there, says that he's actually totally equal with God. Equal with the Father. Equal with the Son. But this is what's amazing. It says there in verse 6 again, even though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. In other words, Jesus didn't look at his equality with God the Father and God the Spirit and say, this is something I've got to have a death grip on. I've got to hold on to because I, if I lose it, that's it. No. Jesus was so certain of his place as God the Son that he could actually set aside that and willingly take on human flesh and become a God incarnate. And that's what verses 7 and 8 tell us about. Not only is Jesus fully God, but it tells us Jesus humbly came in the flesh. You see it? It says he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found again in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He made himself nothing. Think about that for a minute. You know, we just sang that song, Thou Just Leave Thy Throne, and I know it's not a super familiar Christmas carol to a lot of you. But what it helps us understand is what we forget sometimes. How costly it was for Jesus to step away from his place, his rightful place, as God the Son in heaven, and to come into this world. As he did. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> hmm. Because what the Word of God tells us <clears throat> is he left his home in heaven. He left his rightful position. <clears throat> he left his deserved honor. He left the constant recognition that he had. He left the great riches that he held. He even left the perfect relationship that he had with God the Father. And he took all those rightful privileges as God the Son and he set those aside to become, you see it? A servant. A servant. In other words, Jesus went from being the king of the universe to a nondescript man and a servant of people at that. I mean, king of everything to at least king of the world. I mean, to me, that would be a little more powerful. I could understand that. But a servant? But that's exactly what we see Jesus doing throughout his life, don't we? Serving people. Even when he was tired. Even when it was inconvenient. Even when that task was seemingly beneath them. And if you look there in verse 8, it tells us that servant and that service extended all the way to how he died. It says he humbled himself as he was here in human form. He became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, humbly on a cross, in our place, taking our sin upon him so that he could satisfy the justice of God and make it possible for people like us to be freed from sin's bondage, an achievement that we can never pull off for ourselves in a million years, no matter how hard we tried. That's what Jesus did as he came as God in the flesh. Here's the question, though. Was death on the cross all Jesus' time here on earth in the flesh? Is that all it got? Was it worth all the effort and all the sacrifice? Well, notice this third point. Not only is Jesus fully God, not only did Jesus humbly come in the flesh, notice where this is all going. The Word of God tells us Jesus has been elevated. Look at verse 9. 
It starts off with one little word, doesn't it? Therefore. Or if you have a New American Standard, you have the phrase, for this reason. What reason? Well, it goes back to what we just looked at. Referring to the fact Jesus came in the flesh. That he exercised humble obedience all the way throughout his lifetime. Therefore, because Jesus loved us enough to come. Therefore, because he loved us enough to die for us. Notice what has happened. God has highly exalted him. You guys understanding that? By elevating humanity above himself. The word of God tells us Jesus brought glory to God the Father and accomplished the purpose that he was set here for. And now things are turning around. Because now the Father is elevating Jesus to the greatest possible degree. Making sure that everyone knows who Jesus is and what it is that he has accomplished. That's what God's doing for him. That, of course, began with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was the moment when God showed his approval for what Jesus did and thoroughly paying for our sin. That exaltation continued as Jesus returned to heaven and he retook his rightful place, the word of God tells us, at the right hand of God the Father. He is now the undisputed victor over sin and over death and over the grave. And it's still happening. God is still exalting him. It's still unfolding as God continues to make sure that everyone knows of the greatness and the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. Because God's exaltation of Jesus means at least three things according to these verses. First of all, it means Jesus is the one that everyone is talking about. You see it? It says, therefore God has highly exalted him. And what else has he done? He said he's bestowed on, the, on him the name that is above every name. You guys will probably start to see this a lot this week. You know, we get to the end of the year, and you get all those end of the year review things going on. I always like those. You know, I find that kind of interesting because it always jogs my memory a little bit. But what's always shocking to me, you know, at some point during the year, you got someone whose name is in the headlines. Everyone is talking about them. Everyone knows who they are. Six months later, we forget all about them, don't we? That's never going to happen with Jesus Christ. It's never going to happen with Jesus. Because the word of God says God is making sure he is getting the name that is above every name. And when it talks about his name, it's not referring just to a title. It refers to his person. It refers to his position of dignity and honor. In other words, Jesus is sovereign. His power, his authority is final. It's unstoppable. At the end of the day, Jesus is the one who is truly in charge. And his fame is never going to end. Ever. Ever. I find it kind of amusing, as hard as people sometimes work to take Jesus out of the picture. He's always there, isn't he? I was reading about the Nazis this week, how they tried to redefine Christmas according to their own terms, and yet they can never do that fully because people keep coming back to Jesus. You read about the communist government over in China and the crackdown that they have on the church over there and just the persecution that so many of those believers are enduring every single day. But you know what the effect of that is? Is there's more people coming to Christ in China than there ever has been before. Jesus, no matter how hard you try to take him out and stop him, is never going to be stopped. Because he's the name that's above every name. And he's the one everyone is going to be talking about. But it doesn't stop there. Because the word of God goes on and tells us not only does Jesus' name that everyone's going to be talking about, Jesus is the one that everyone is going to be submitting to. See it in verse 10? It says, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And you guys know how it works. I mean, all throughout history, there have been people who have rebelled against those who are in authority over them. Sometimes rightfully, sometimes wrongly. I mean, I got friends right now who are missionaries in Peru. They just kicked out their president last week. It's a mess down there right now. 
the word of God says God is working to ensure that nobody dare challenge Jesus' greatness and place as the rightful ruler of the universe. Because it says it doesn't matter who it is, all right? Every knee is going to bow, and that's going to be true whether that person is in heaven or it's on earth or under the earth. Meaning, you know what? It doesn't matter if it's angels or there's believers in heaven. They're going to bow their knee. It doesn't matter if it's people who are living here on the earth. The day is coming. They're going to submit to Jesus. It doesn't matter if it's Satan and the demons and the unsaved in hell. No intelligent being in all of God's universe is going to escape bowing the knee to Jesus. They're either going to do that willingly or they're going to be made to do so. Because that's how great he is. Jesus is the one everyone's going to be talking about. Jesus is the one that everyone is going to be submitting to. But notice this last thing. Jesus is also the one everyone is going to be acknowledging. Because it goes on in verse 11 and it says this. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In other words, Jesus is the true God and the king of the universe of everyone and everything everywhere over all time. And I got to tell you, you may be able to avoid Jesus for a lifetime, but you're not going to avoid him forever. The day is going to come when you will recognize him for who he really is. Worthy of your faith, worthy of your allegiance, worthy of your surrender, worthy of your obedience. And again, as you look at this passage, you'll find that God the Father is guaranteeing every single one of these things is going to happen. No exceptions here at all are offered. God is exalting the Jesus who came in the flesh for us. It's what he deserves. But here's what I need you to think about today. If God the Father has responded in such incredible fashion to what Jesus accomplished through the incarnation, how much more should we be responding to all that Jesus has accomplished on our behalf while he was here in the flesh? Things that we would have zero opportunity of ever experiencing otherwise. The scary thing about the Christmas story is that we become so familiar with that baby in the manger and everything that went with it that it just be kind of comes whole home, doesn't it? We give it very little thought. But Jesus deserves. He deserves to be recognized. He deserves to be revered as the Lord of our lives, the sovereign creator of everything, the Savior who has come into this world to make it possible for every single one of us to know God if we were only believe in him. The word of God tells us that Jesus deserves to be submitted to and humbly obeyed no matter how difficult or how costly that obedience might seem. The word of God tells us Jesus deserves to be worshipped and to praise with all of our beings. And here's the awesome thing. When we elevate Jesus, not only do we get a head start on what is going to happen regardless, the word of God says God gets glorified because it says there at the end of verse 11, as every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord, that is to the glory of God the Father. In other words, God's recognition and his reputation gets displayed. And I'll just remind you all, that's the very reason we are here on earth today. To make much of God who loved us so much that he took time to come in the flesh. So as we close out our study in the incarnation today and why it still matters, I just have two considerations to kind of put before you. First of all, Maybe you're here today, on this day that we celebrate the birth of Jesus, but you have never turned to Jesus in total belief and decided that he is going to be your Savior and your Lord. See, that baby just didn't stay a baby. He grew up to die, to pay for your sins and to pay for my sins. 
He came back to life three days later as God elevated him and did the unthinkable. He beat the grave. He beat death so that you can have eternal life. If you've never sought him for forgiveness of your sins, and you've never sought him and believed in him and what he did for you as the way to God, that's what Christmas is about. This is your opportunity to do that. If you'd like to do that, I would encourage you, come talk to me before you leave today. Make sure you know as you go from this place that you have the Christ of Christmas living in you. Here's the second consideration. For those of you who have chosen Jesus as your Savior, is your life showing Jesus is your Lord? Again, that's what the Word of God says here in Philippians chapter 2 is going to happen one way or the other. But why should we wait until we have to? Why not begin that now by the way that we live? Obeying Him. Revering Him. Loving Him with all that we have. What a wonderful gift we have been given in Jesus. Come in the flesh. And we need to make sure that we are exalting him. I hope you will think about those things as we end the day just very simply. By putting to practice what we've just seen from the word of God and praising Jesus. We all stand and sing with me just four little short simple verses that I hope will help us, I help will help us focus on Jesus Come in the flesh. Come for us. Helping us remember he deserves our praise. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Christ the Lord will praise his name forever. Will praise his name forever. Will praise his name forever. Christ the Lord will give him all the glory. Will give him all the glory. Will give him all the glory. Christ the Lord. For he alone is worthy. For he alone is worthy. For he alone is worthy. Christ the Lord. And Jesus, we just thank you for being worthy today. We thank you for coming in the flesh to reveal God to us, to understand us, to save us. And for all that, we just say thank you. May we, through our lives, from this Christmas and beyond, live like you were Lord of them. And may we bring more glory to you because that is what you deserve. Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name this morning. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Merry Christmas. You all are dismissed.